So let's begin. Good morning, everybody. Thank you guys for joining us today. Uh, we have a panel today around distressed opportunities. So perfect timing for that. Uh, looking forward to getting to that conversation. Before we do, I have a few housekeeping things that I'd like to get through. So bear with me. My name is Lena Dobrier. I'm the Director of Operations at Opus Connect. We are a lower middle and middle market M&A focused organization. We cater to transactional professionals, typically private equity firms, investment bankers, lenders, independent sponsors, etc. Uh, we're membership based. We have chapters in Los Angeles, New York, and Chicago, where if we weren't sheltering in place, we would be in each of those cities monthly. Um, and in addition to those, we have our deal sourcing events, which we do all around the country, typically. Currently, we're doing them all virtually. Uh, and I think many of you are participating in our Distress Deal Connect today. So if you're interested in learning a bit more about Opus Connect or the events that we have coming up, uh, please reach out to my colleague, Jacob Zephyrin. His contact information is there below. We'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, moving forward, our panel may take live Q&A. They'll try and weave that into the conversation today. So as questions pop into your mind, feel free at the bottom of your screen there, you'll see a Q&A. Uh, section there where you can click on there and type in your question. Our moderator uh, will field those questions and again we'll try to get to as many as possible. These events would not be possible without the support of our sponsors so I definitely want to give each of them an opportunity to say a quick few words. I see Duncan here from NFP. We'll start with you. Uh, Duncan, please introduce yourself and your firm. Great. Thank you, uh, Lena. This is Duncan Cummings with uh, NFP. NFP is a leading insurance broker and consultant. We've got 6,000 employees and uh, over 350 offices across the US, Canada, and the UK. And uh, our business was built on the back of private equity. So we know uh, the needs of both our uh, owners and clients on the private equity side when it comes to insurance. Um, you know, as of late, we've been helping out with pre and post deal due diligence, a lot of cross portfolio uh, aggregation and um, transactional insurance items like rep and warranty on, on new deals. Um, obviously related to this panel, but uh, when it comes to distressed opportunities, uh, we have an M&A team that works on uh, insurance optimization uh, for uh, distressed situations. Um, so if that is a topic of interest, you know, I'm always happy to have a uh, conversation. Um, but again, thank you to Opus for hosting and thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, Duncan. Uh, let's move on to our next sponsor here is Resourceive. I don't believe anyone from Resourceive is in the room today, but I definitely do want to briefly acknowledge them. If you are in the room, go ahead and raise your hand and we'll come back to you. Uh, Focus Search Partners is Steve Finder on the line. I don't believe he is, uh, but Steve, if you join us before we get through these, please raise your hand uh, with them. Matthew, I see you here. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Uh, please introduce yourself and your firm. Uh oh. Matthew, are you there? Might need to unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yep, there you go. Great, thank you. Uh, my name is Matthew Barrett. I'm a business development executive at Witham. Uh, we're very happy to be sponsoring our second Opus Connect event. I know I'm in the process of setting up meetings with several of you, but I'll give you some general information on Witham. Witham is a top 20 accounting firm with offices in Boston, New York City, New Jersey, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., Orlando, and California. I'm here representing our transaction advisory team and forensic valuation team, which assists with restructuring and turnaround management, as well as bankruptcy and insolvency issues. Ken DeGraw from our forensic valuation team will be presenting on restructuring and turnaround management today during the break at 3 p.m. Uh, several services that we offer that can assist complex issues regarding mergers and acquisitions, our quality of earnings reports, purchase price allocations, business valuations, portfolio valuations, tangible asset valuations, field exams, cost segregation studies, and transfer pricing studies. I hope you guys have a nice uh, day today, and I look forward to speaking with you later on uh, today and later next week. 
Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, and last but not least, we have uh, Kalari Partners. Carolyn Kalari is actually moderating today's panel, so we're gonna wait on that intro uh, until I introduce her. And before we get to the main event, we do have a couple questions that we'd like to ask you as the audience, so please don't be shy and participate in these quick questions. First, we wanna know, how did you hear about today's event? Uh, are we doing our jobs marketing? Did you hear from our sponsors, our speakers? Let us know, this is helpful information for us, so we appreciate your participation there. We'll give it about 15 more seconds and then we'll move right along. There's 100 people in here, only 60 of you have voted but I see that number going up as I'm speaking, so that's good. We'll give it five seconds here and then we will move forward uh, and share those results. So it looks like a lot of you heard from Opus Connect, our speakers, thank you so much for your support, uh, sponsors as well, good to know for us. Next question before we begin is, which best describes you? This is very helpful for our panelists so they can kind of tailor that discussion to you in the audience. So let us know who you are and we'll give it about 20 seconds and then we will begin. Don't be shy. Great, uh, so it looks like 11% independent sponsors, 24% investment bankers, 11% on the debt side uh, of capital providers, on the equity side, 11%, interesting. Okay, awesome. So thank you guys for participating in that. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Carolyn Kalari, longtime supporter of Opus. She helps lead our New York chapter, and she also does some other things that she's going to tell you about. So Carolyn, please take it away. And you'll need to unmute yourself. I'm sorry. There you go. Wonderful. Thank you, Lena. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, ju just briefly, we're going to introduce ourselves so you know who's talking with you today. Um, Kalari Partners is a corporate boutique law firm that's focused on middle market business transactions. We help investors and business owners strategize and pursue their business goals. We focus on providing general counsel, M&A, and restructuring legal services to the middle market companies. Um, the firm is comprised of former big firm lawyers. Um, I, myself, was with Amlaw 100 firms for 20 years. I was first in the business restructuring group of Wilkie, Farr and Gallagher, and then Venable before launching Kalari Partners. Our clients are pretty diverse. Uh, we have clients ranging from individual investors and business owners to multi-million dollar companies and family offices. Um, plus we're a woman owned firm, but our full bio is in the materials. Uh, so we have the experience. If you need some guidance or legal representation with business deals, whether healthy or distressed, uh, we are here to help. So please feel free to reach out to me. And we can go to the um, next, let's go with uh, Dan. Great, thank you very much, Carolyn. Appreciate it, thank you for having me today. Uh, I'm Dan Arnold, I am a Senior Vice President with Hilco Global. So Hilco is kind of a unique organization. We do a bunch of different things. We don't fit neatly into a bucket. Really, if you were to look across all of our businesses, we're effectively a merchant bank that's focused on assets. So we can act as an advisor related to those assets. We can value those assets or probably more relevant to this panel, we invest in those assets in a variety of ways, either to operate businesses, to liquidate businesses or to redevelop assets. Uh, some of my other colleagues are here today. So we do have a traditional investment bank. So some of you might be seeing Brian Graves later today in the in the conference, but a uh, broad range of businesses. I sit at our holding company, so I work across 
all the various groups at ILCO and uh, appreciate being here today. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Jared. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, thanks to Opus Connect as well. Uh, Jared Gregg with Crystal Financial. Crystal is a secured lender. Um, we offer ABL products that include both senior and junior secured uh, securities. On the senior secured, we can act as a dollar one lender, uh, typically against working capital assets, both revolvers and term loans. Most of these opportunities for us are typically special situations um, where a traditional commercial lender may not have interest. Uh, we also offer junior secured investments, including um, last outs and unit tranches, um, second lien deals, split lien deals, as well as first in last out term loans. Um, those situations and opportunities typically allow a borrower to access additional liquidity behind what a traditional lender, um, an asset based lender would provide. Uh, Crystal also offers um, cash flow lending solutions, although that's re less relevant to today's uh, conversation. Um, when you think about dollar one deals against working capital, uh, Crystal's typically as a non-bank lender more aggressive in advance rates um, and in structuring deals and providing some additional uh, flexibility, whether that's um, not having any covenants, um, um, providing an air ball or stretch piece on the enterprise value and cash flows of the underlying business. Um, and our junior secure deals are typically within a borrowing based framework, although uh, again, they do provide some additional flexibility. Crystal is part of the solar capital umbrella. Solar is managing six billion. Um, they're out of New York and the credit, it's a 100% credit platform. We are one of several commercial finance vehicles uh, within uh, the solar umbrella. Um, we back both PE and uh, sponsor, uh, non-sponsored portfolios. Um, we are a generalist in our approach, although we have a lot of experience doing retail asset-based lending, uh, which is a, quite a dynamic industry right now, as well as specialty finance. More generally, we like alternative assets, whether it's recurring revenue, sticky contracted cash flows, et cetera. Uh, we don't invest in energy and we don't invest in restaurants, but aside from that, we'll look at anything so long as it doesn't fall outside of our ESG mandate. And I would say Crystal is a great partner. We are very client centric and we are very flexible um, in meeting the needs of our borrowers. We're often involved in situations where it's not up and to the right, where there are some issues with the underlying performance of business, whether it's operational or capital structure, stress or distress. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. Um, Jason. Good morning, Carolyn, and thank you. And uh, thank you to the Opus team for including me in today's, uh, today's uh, event. Uh, Sand River Capital is my firm uh, with uh, three other professionals, as well as a network of uh, partners we've worked with on it. Jason, I'm sorry to interrupt. <clears throat> if you could speak up a little bit, we're having a little trouble hearing you. Sure. Uh, we focus on MA, uh, debt advisory and special situations, the latter of which is obviously the focus of today's panel. Uh, we focus on helping stakeholders uh, as opposed to shareholders. Uh, and we represent both borrowers, lenders, and portfolio companies. Uh, so this, the uh, industries we work in include industrials, manufacturing, oil and gas, oil and services, business services, and uh, and recently we're working on a couple of consumer-related uh, businesses as well. Typically, we're working with evolving businesses that are in need of a recapitalization and or um, and or allied sale, and we help navigate. Uh, Typically, complex situations is where uh, is, is our sweet sweet spot. Glad to be on today's panel and, and look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Jason. Mark, let's switch to you. Good morning. Uh, thank you for having me, Carolyn and Opus Connect. Um, uh, I'm Mark Padgani. I'm a managing director at Getzla Henrik in New York. Uh, Getzla Henrik is a 50 plus year old management consulting firm that works with stressed and distressed companies in the middle market. Um, we've uh, historically provided uh, uh, turnaround, restructuring, crisis management uh, services, and uh, industry agnostic uh, all around the country. Um, we also have uh, a group, uh, GH Valens, that works with private equity portfolio companies uh, doing performance improvement work, uh, such as uh, top line and margin growth, cost reduction, um, data analytics and dashboarding, supply chain, um, and, and civil services. And uh, uh, thanks again for having me here today. Thank you, Mark. 
and Michael. Uh, good morning, everybody. And again, thank you for having me here today. Uh, I've been on Wall Street for 35 years. Uh, for the last three years, I've been a managing director and head of the financial restructuring group at Charwell. Uh, Charwell is a mid-market investment banking firm. We focus on the privately owned middle market, uh, primarily family-owned businesses, founder-owned businesses, and ESOP-owned businesses. Uh, we do M&A, we do financial restructuring, and we do capital raising. Uh, before I joined Charwell, I was at AIG. I joined AIG right after the bailout as a senior managing director in the restructuring group, right after the bailout. And for three and a half years, I was a senior member of the group that successfully repaid the government $180 billion. And after that, I was the COO of the finance department at AIG for four years uh, before leaving and joining Charwell. Uh, prior to AIG, uh, I had 25 years of experience on Wall Street, investment banking, uh, primarily larger firms uh, where I focused on restructuring, leveraged M&A, et cetera. And it's great to be here today. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. So it's great to have all of you. I appreciate your, your time today. And to the audience, we tried to comprise people that I want to speak to about the distressed market, people that are helping other people find the deals, those that are investing, those that are lending, those that are providing restructuring services. So I think this should be very informative. We are going to try to get through as many of our questions as we can. Feel free to post questions. We'll I'll try to inter intertwine them into our outline uh, as best we can. Otherwise, we'll do it at the end. But before we do that, we would like to uh, give one more poll question to find out if you have experience investing in distressed companies. So if you've just touched on it, I would say no. We're really trying to see if our audience is very experienced or really is a healthy M&A um, individual looking to get more information about the stress. So if you could answer that, that would help us. Okay, so most of you have it, some of you don't have experience with distressed transactions, which will help us because that means we can go through some of this a bit quicker. Um, if we, there are going to be a few occasions where we cover something at a pretty high level because we only have an hour and at this point about 45 minutes to really go through what we wanna go through on the opportunities you have in distressed investing and valuation issues. So if you miss something, if we go too fast, there, this is going to be recorded and you can check in later. All right, so with that, let's actually just get into it and talk about the unique opportunities for, um, for distressed investing. We'll start it off by really, Jason, let's start with you and maybe you can walk us through what are some of the key differences generally between a healthy M&A transaction and a distressed transaction? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll give that a, give that a try. Uh, I think in a distressed transaction, there's some unique uh, things about the transaction that can be supported uh, by, uh, from a buyer perspective by a, uh, a suite of advisors. And those include uh, tra distressed transactions usually need speed to your analysis because they're, they're timing catalysts that are, that are quicker than a normal M&A transaction. Uh, there's also considerations around stakeholders as opposed to just a seller, um, particularly with respect to what the fulcrum security is and the, the rights and interests and willingness to, uh, to negotiate with impaired creditors. Uh, and Jason, I'm so sorry to interrupt you again. People are having a lot of trouble hearing you. Maybe you could 
sit a little closer or just speak louder. It sounds a little bit muffled. I apologize. Okay, thank you. Um, I think the uh, the other thing that goes on in a distressed transaction is you've got a compressed time frame, uh, a broader set of stakeholders, and uh, you know, in a creditor stack, including the paired creditors that need consideration. You've got um, you need a you have a need for effective communication and negotiation with a, uh, a broader um, set of uh, set of people. And then there's, depending on whether it's an in-court restructuring or an out-of-court out of, out of court restructuring, there are processes that need to be in place, and which I think we'll get to later in this panel, uh, panel discussion, milestones that need, need to be met that are, that are different in, than in typical M&A process. However, at the end of the day, you know, the, as a buyer, what you're ultimately looking for is the future cash flow or the future asset value of the business as opposed to current capital stats. So the, the process is really a function of where the company's been, not necessarily a view of where it can go or what the ultimate value can be. Okay, um, so what I'm hearing there is uh, certainly it's a more expedited speed. The, the focus of the analysis is a bit different looking to the future. Um, Mark, what else do you have? Uh, obviously, the, there could be liquidity challenges, um, uh, unstable business, uh, con conflict with counterparties. Um, you know, those are some things. Uh, uh, the valuation may be murky. Um, as Jason said, you know, you're kind of looking to the future rather than assets, and, you know, or sorry, looking to the past and, and to assets and not to the future necessarily because you're not sure what the future is going to be. Um, uh, there's also... Um, uh, court could be a factor here. Um, you could be doing something in, in bankruptcy court. So those are some other things that uh, can typically uh, come up. And one last thing I might add is the management team. A lot of times when you're looking to buy a business, uh, you're betting on the management team. Well, here, I don't know if you want to be betting on the management team that got, got into a mess in the first place. So uh, you're probably betting on some other management team uh, in, in the distress transaction. Okay. So certainly the deal structures uh, are going to be different and we're going to need some creative solutions. I think there's also often a cash squeeze that happens with the distressed deals, which also puts to Jason's point, uh, time constraints are often in your due diligence are go is going to be limited, right? All of these things are very different than a healthy M&A where you can take your time and get comfortable with a transaction before you invest. Um, Jared, from a lender's perspective, is there any general difference how you approach a loan with a distressed business? Yeah, we, I mean, we think early uh, as a lender uh, about the process and the deal dynamics, um, and specifically, what is the probability that the deal that um, we're supporting is ultimately going to close? So we're going to evaluate the buyer and, and the angle or angles that um, the firm or the entrepreneur has in terms of um, looking at the asset, winning the asset, um, and kind of some in insider, um, you know, opportunities or, or angles that they may have in working with existing management to the extent they'll, um, they'll continue on. Um, we also look at the existing lender pack. Um, is there an op opportunity for us to put a dip loan in place so that we can get involved earlier? Who are the pre-petition lenders? Is there, you know, likely interest from those folks to um, provide exit financing? Um, might they be interested in credit bidding the asset? Um, are they likely to be in a position where they could own some of the business upon conversion and upon a plan of reorganization? Um, and then timing to close. Timing to close is very important in terms of being able to execute on a deal se seamlessly for our clients. We also look at the uh, pro forma financial picture of the business. Oftentimes, um, a business is shedding liabilities, whether it's in court or out of court, rejecting leases, um, getting rid of unprofitable customer contracts. So we need to evaluate what that pro forma business looks like and you know, a sustainable capital structure that can go alongside it. Um, and then kind of part and parcel of that, Carolyn, is liquidity. You know, it's been mentioned many times, but we certainly don't want to see any round trips back into bankruptcy, affectionately known as Chapter 22's. Um, life is too short to get into a loan and, and have to work it out in a fairly short period. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Jared. So it does sound like there's a lot of additional factors that a lender will look at when it is entering into uh, a lending situation for a distressed transaction. So that's the general background of the differences between a healthy transaction and a distress. 
But Michael, can you walk us through what, what is unique? And this is why we're talking here today, is this cycle is unique. What we're going through is unique, but what, what is unique about it? Well, in my 30 plus years on uh, Wall Street, and this is my view, uh, we've seen four major financial market dislocations. The first one, the early 90s, the junk bond blow up, the recession, the bankruptcy of Drexel. The second one in 01, caused by the bursting of the teletech bubble with 9-11 added onto it. The third, of course, the financial crisis, the fourth today. All of the other ones were primarily credit related. This one is not. This was completely caused by an externality, a non-economic factor, a health-related factor. So it's unique in that way, in that it wasn't, this is, hasn't been a credit market blow up causing it, but it's been caused by an externality. We've also had the first government mandated shutdown of businesses. In other words, in past financial market dislocations, everybody was open, everybody was doing business. They might have been off 5%, they might have been off 10%, they might have been off 20%, but they were, uh, uh, they were in business. Here, you know, there are a lot of companies, a lot of the clients that we talk to don't know exactly when they're going to be able to restart, to what level they're going to be able to restart, when they might be shut down again. So in other words, that's a sort of, again, an issue that's outside of the control of uh, the corp uh, corporate America. So this crisis really is very different from the past financial market dislocations in those respects. Anyone else want to see? Yeah, what I would say uh, the things I would add to it, I think Michael's comments were great, but the things I would add to it is that in this crisis, you've really, you've got a, uh, a new legal structure for really small businesses called Chapter 5, which is in a lower cost and expedited structure, which I think we'll touch on later in the panel as well. Uh, you've also got a different capital market structure in the in the sort of rise and growth and evolution of limited partner direct investing in family, particularly in family offices and endowments. Uh, and so those can be different partners and sources of capital, and that was not necessarily the case uh, in, in, in such scale 10 or 20 years ago. And then finally, I would just uh, mention that unlike those uh, past crises, because of the difference, uh, differences that Michael suggested here is that LTM, EBITDA, or cash flows are really not good proxies for future value. And so the, the traditional um, method that which people at least initially approach a valuation from a cash flow perspective um, aren't good proxies because of the dynamics of the situation. And Carolyn, if I could chime in, I think Please one stand. of the interesting things about this, uh, this issue is that it's so broad-based. Right. When you look at, as Michael went through, the past crises were really focused on a single industry. If I look at this issue um, and what we're seeing, at least at Hilco, really, you know, obviously retail and travel and hospitality are having major issues, but you're also talking about really substantial stress in energy, in auto, in healthcare, in commercial real estate, in consumer credit. You're talking about really substantial stress in large swaths of the economy that really are unique to this issue, to this crisis, that really haven't existed in other, in other economic downturns. And if I, if I could add uh, one or two other quick things, one is um, the scale of government uh, intervention, let's say, uh, both uh, you know, between the Fed and uh, uh, the PPP money, Main Street lending, uh, cash to consumers is uh, probably unprecedented. Um, and then you also have a global forbearance situation where everybody's just kind of giving everybody a break for a period of time just to see what happens. And, um, you know, when do you ever see anyone giving anyone a break? That never happens. So I think that's um, also unusual. I yeah, you know, okay. I'm, I'm sorry, if I can break in, you know, Mark brought, just brought up a very good point about government assistance. And obviously, being an AIG restructuring person back in 09, I'm certainly familiar with government assistance. But what's interesting is back in 08, 09, 
The government assistance was purely for the big financial institutions. It was to prop up the financial system. Now, it's not the financial system that needs the money. It's a totally different universe, small businesses, Main Street America, unemployed people. That's who the beneficiaries of the government money is now, which is really vastly different from 08, 09, the financial crisis. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And, and that adds, that supports the position that we, in 09, there was a, a credit crunch. There was a lack of liquidity. And back then I remember people saying, why aren't there more bankruptcies? And I said, because there's no money. You need money to fund a bankruptcy and no one was lending. Here, there's plenty of dry powder, um, but th so, but but everyone operationally is it's just a disaster. So, very different framework that we're dealing with, and across the industry, so it's a bit hard to pinpoint this. All right, so let's let's stick with you, Michael. Um, so, with this backdrop, you're helping your clients find deals and and financing. What kind of assets and what kind of businesses should an investor be looking for in this down in this in this down market? Well, honestly, uh, oversold assets. If everybody else is sell is selling, you should be thinking of buying. Again, if you go back to 1991, people made a ton of money buying junk bonds at the absolute bottom of the market. They were a totally discredited asset class back then. You look at 2008. Interestingly, the Fed made a ton of money buying real estate securitizations. That wasn't their purpose, but they took over the AIG portfolio. They took over the Bear Stearns portfolio of RMBS and CMBS. And even though they weren't in it to make money, they made a lot of money at the end of the day just because those assets were so discredited and so oversold. So I'm not an investor. I'm not an investment bank. I'm an investment banker. But I think you got to look for what's oversold, what's everybody running away from. And again, I'm not an investor, but I have some clients in hospitality. Uh, I, I like hospitality, hotels, transportation. I mean, they're, they're very low in occupancy right now. They've really been beaten down, but, you know, the world will come back. So, uh, you know, that's something I'm working with some clients in just as, a, as an industry. So staying with that for a minute, it sounds like, looking at the, what you really need to do is look where the, the opportunities are in the industries that you think have a comeback, right? So I yes. think what you have to look at is which ones will come back, which ones will come back quicker than others. And, and so I, I think I'm looking at all the men on the screen here going, I'm sure sports will come back very quickly as soon as, you know, the government allows it, right? So I have no doubt if you're sports related, people are still going to get into sports as much as they did before this. Maybe the arenas won't be so filled, right? So that really relates to entertainment and how quickly is that? How quickly are movie theaters and where people are need to get comfortable being with a big group again, right? So to your point, Michael, it's a, a valid point. You, you, have to, you have to analyze which sectors are going to come back quicker um, and which ones maybe not at all, right? I think that's what you're saying. Yeah, and you know, you really got to look for the stuff that everybody else is avoiding. You know, the stuff that, you know, where everybody's selling, you should be thinking about buying. And, you know, <clears throat> I, I, again, I like hospitality. I like hotels. Big crowds aren't involved, and people will begin traveling again at some point in the future. So, Dan, where where are you, where is Hilco investing these days? Where are you looking? Yeah, I think that you know I, I'll take a little bit of a different approach than Michael had because I, I think he's right. You know, Hilco at its core is an opportunistic buyer of assets. So, absolutely, when things are trading down, that's where we go. That said, 
I think particularly in this environment, you have to be very selective about what you're going after. So if I were gonna invest in a hotel at this moment, I would be investing in a hotel in a very strong core market that has strong underlying fundamentals in terms of the asset value, as opposed to a secondary or tertiary market, um, something that's going to age well over time. So I'll give you an example. We're seeing a ton of oil field services deals right now. Hilco is not currently an active buyer of much in the way of oil field services assets. The reason is because the time frame of that is very uncertain and they're not assets that age well. So you, if you have oil field services equipment sitting on the sideline for one year, two years, three years, it doesn't age like wine. Um, and you might be sitting on really a, a heap of scrap metal at the end of this thing. And there's no buyers of it right now. So, you know, you need core underlying value. You need things that are going to perform well over time. And you also need, if the timing is uncertain, which I think it very much is uncertain right now, um, you need to have the ability or the wherewithal to ride out that time, right? There's obviously costs to holding assets over periods of time, whether it's operating losses or whatever holding costs exist. Um, you need to be able to, to build that in conservatively. And if you can do that and you have the time frame to do it, I think you can be extremely successful. So, you know, we're active buyers of what we think are is uh, valuable real estate right now. We just closed uh, our largest real estate transaction ever. We bought a, an old oil refinery that had been shut down in Philadelphia, um, a 1300 acre property uh, in, in Philadelphia that we're going to redevelop into a logistics center. But the value of the underlying real estate is unbelievable. Um, it's in a very key location with rail access, water access, highway access, and um, with a site that's literally a one and a half percent of the entire city of Philadelphia um, that you can't recreate. So over time, that will maintain its value. Uh, we just bought a truck leasing business where we think right, trucks will maintain value over time. And we came in at a steep discount to what we think the core underlying value of those assets are. So if you can find assets with core underlying value that will maintain that value over time, that's really, for us at least, the, the key consideration right now. Anyone else? So go ahead, Jason. I, I would just say that I think that uh, to Michael's point earlier, I think that in the middle market where most of, most of us navigate, most of this audience probably navigates, it's very different uh, dynamic just because the capital waiting on the sidelines has expertise already in place at the large, uh, you know, the, the top 10 private equity firms and the, the other large institutional investors. And so I think it, you know, to Michael's point, you need to look at places where asset prices are, it's not, I would slightly answer that question a little differently, where asset prices are dislocated in different ways. So it's not that necessarily nobody else is looking there. And obviously we've got a whole, forum and audience today that um, that is looking for opportunities in the middle market. But it's more like, you know, where can we play where we're not competing with larger pools of capital that are coming in to buy larger businesses because they are themselves focused on a roll up in a particular segment or, or industry. And I think there are, um, you know, that finding those kind of niches um, across industries is an opportunity for people right now. Yeah, and, and Jason, staying with that for a second, you mentioned roll ups. And so what are your thoughts about, about current businesses uh, doing add-ons at this time? Is it a good time to do an add-on? I, I think actually for, you know, for sponsors or family-owned businesses that um, already had a roll-up plan or maybe they didn't, um, that, you know, one of the obvious ways to, uh, to um, turn a business that's low cash flow or negative cash flow to positive cash flow through a, in a period in a cycle like this is through scale um, because the larger you can scale revenues then you can get economies of scale on your cost of goods gold and you can spread gna um over a, a larger set of revenues and customer bases so i think that actually these cycles at the beginning of the cycle and I, I would argue we're still in that phase just because of the, uh, I think what was earlier on the call referred to as global forbearance um, and also because asset prices are still dislocated and that's really a hindrance to, to any kind of transaction M&A &A because people can't find stability around those asset classes. But as we navigate, I think that we will see a lot of M&A uh, and a lot of M&A, particularly on bolt-on M&A because it will help, help 
businesses scale to a place quicker than maybe was the original plan uh, when the family started the business or the sponsor bought it or what, whoever the, the current ownership and, and uh, current lender set is, but that, that will uh, return it to a uh, possibly a quicker exit, but, uh, but a more accelerated plan around achieving scale. Okay. So let's, let's move on actually to the fact that how are you going to value these businesses in this market? Um, you know, with the uncertainty uh, for the future, how are people, you know, um, what, what should people be considering when they're valuing a business? Michael, let's go back to you with that. Sure. Well, right now, it's no secret that valuation is particularly difficult. You're riding blind in a lot of situations. Because as one of the panelists said a few moments ago, I forgot who it was, you know, you look at 2019 earnings and they're completely irrelevant. It's, it's ancient history. It, 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 that's not where the, where the company is today. So in a certain sense, you almost need multiple sets of projections. If you're analyzing a company normally, what do you do? You create a forecast, you move it up 5%, that's your best case. You move it down 10%, that's your worst case. You adjust the price a little bit. I mean, you just sort of finagle uh, the base case projection. But here you, you really can't have a base case projection since there's no visibility. You have to have multiple sets. For example, you know, I was talking to a client a few weeks ago, a retailer, a mall retailer. All of their stores had been closed and he was beginning to reopen them. And literally, you know, uh, this is even a successful retailer. And uh, two days before he was going to start reopening stores, he was very scared. He goes, I don't know if customers are going to show up. Are customers going to show up in a mall to go to my store? I, I just, you know, don't know. So it's, it's, it really is sort of the least visibility I've seen, which really, you know, you just got to create multiple sets of projections based on multiple scenarios, uh, such as when am I going to be reopened? Am I going to be shut down again, et cetera? Okay, so sticking with that, well, let's go, let me first hear from, was it uh, Dan? How is Hillco, you, you guys all just moved around my screen for some reason, but uh, <laughs> uh, Dan, how is Hillco approaching, you touched on it, but how is Hillco approaching valuing the companies in this yeah. environment? Our valuation approach has not changed. And, you know, Hillco has historically you know, we tend to be a little bit counter cyclical. Frankly, we do well in volatile environments in general, but our approach has always been asset value. And so, you know, from that, and that's what we're really good at, understanding the value of assets. So in that respect, we actually have not had to change our approach in this environment. We have been a little bit more selective, I'd say, uh, just given the uncertainty on particular types of assets. Um, but really, that's been the key to our formula since our founding. And when we look at assets, it's what, where do we realize the value of those assets? All right, is it through an operating business? Is that the way to maximize the value of that business? Do we liquidate those assets or do we redevelop or repurpose a piece of real estate or something like that? And so we have a pretty broad and entrepreneurial approach to it. But for us, the, you know, understanding the value of the assets is the key. And I think that works um, in, in any downturn and in particular this one where, you know, you can protect, we, we protect our downside always. And we're very conservative in that approach. And if you can invest in that kind of a, with that kind of a philosophy, you can, uh, you can be active and successful even in a, even in a downturn like this. Okay. I'm thinking through that, thinking that there may be some industries where their assets are impacted and we're not sure what the values are. I mean, even real estate, I look at that. And if a landlord can no longer get the rent that it was getting, at least in the short term, I'm just, I'm just not sure if it impacts the value there or not. That's a, that's a great point. You know, we're, we're not the guys coming in and, you know, paying an eight cap because we think it's worth a six cap, right? We're taking, we're taking shuttered, um, 
uh, coal-fired power plants, shuttered oil refineries, shuttered steel mills, shuttered shipbuilding yards. There is no NOI at all. It's just okay. a land. A lot of times there's uh, severe environmental liabilities associated with that that we've gotten really good at underwriting and understanding. And so, right, understanding that, like if you take this Philadelphia deal, we have a 10 year investment horizon on that. And we're not gonna be getting income for several years. And it's gonna take, frankly, you know, this was a public number, but we bought this thing for over $225 million, all equity. And it's gonna take several hundred million dollars of demolition, decommissioning and remediation costs um, before it really becomes an income producing property. So if you can capitalize a business that way, and we have partners in that, we, we're not able to do deals that big on our own. Um, but uh, if you can capitalize a business like that and you have core underlying value in the assets, um, you, you can be very successful in this environment. Okay, so I just wanted to make that distinguish for our audience that you're not dealing with operating companies a lot of the times and you're looking at the assets there. Again, it's all always what's the value of the assets. That's right. Okay, so Jared, from a lender's point of view, what are some of the considerations that an asset-based lender is using to address um, during its underwriting process? The asset-based lending product uh, is really designed and serves um, transitional borrowers very well. Um, as lenders, we're planning for the worst, but hoping for the best. And when you plan for the worst, you structure a borrowing base that's appropriate and reflective of what the ultimate liquidation value of the collateral is. And so you need to be within that box. And the borrowing base um, is structured in a way that the lender is going to evaluate ineligibles, long dated accounts receivable, um, slow turning inventory, uh, creating reserves, um, limiting the amount of customer concentration um, in terms of the receivables that can be included within the borrowing base. Um, we're going to want cash dominion on the bank accounts. Um, ABL um, definitely has higher reporting requirements, which can be cumbersome for the finance team at the borrower, including weekly or monthly borrowing bases, monthly interim financials, the requirement to have audits, regular field exams, uh, appraisals, et cetera. So um, there's lots of considerations in terms of how to structure the deal from the lender standpoint that the borrower also need to get comfortable with. And then I think everyone on the panel is evaluating this and, and you know, as part and parcel to this um, kind of unique, um, um, unique environment is, you know, what is the one-time COVID impact versus the ongoing operational risk of the underlying business? And are you lending into a solvent situation? Um, or, you know, are there some issues with the company that are being kind of thrown into the COVID bucket? And so I think we're all assessing that real time. And, and are you assessing what is the situation and if it is not a one-time COVID situation, if it's a multiple COVID situation, right? And looking at how they, how they did during this cycle and what lessons were learned and how they might do if this happens again. I think that's right. And you know, to, to, to Michael's point, you know, they're, they're, um, this one is unique. And I think you know, the resurgence could even further delay the reopening of the economy and, and the need to have ultimately several um, underwriting cases when it comes to forecast, because there, there could be uh, multiple directions that, that we go from a macro standpoint that obviously has implications on borrowers. I think I could add to that too, Carolyn, that if um, I, I, I agree with your point and, and with Jared's point that uh, none of us here in this panel audience or world really know how long the, the COVID shutdowns and reopenings are going to have. On the other hand, you know, I'd make the counterpoint to sort of saying you can't necessarily, you, you, this is not riskless investing for anybody in this audience or in this, in, in this panel. And I think it's human nature a little bit to focus on the crisis we've just been through and maybe the pre previous crisis as opposed to getting back to basics and sort of saying what's the, um, what are the future risks that we're really trying to underwrite to. And so I think investors can both miss opportunities as well as miss um, you know, lenders and investors can miss thinking about future risks by overly focusing on the environment and the, the recent pain point. Okay, so, so in a distressed situation, 
usually we're looking at uh, or valuing based on assets and certainly in this distress situation whereas in a healthy situation you're also often looking at the cash flow uh, you know you get EBITDA you throw on a multiple and there's your value I mean I'm simplifying it but very different in this kind of situation where you have these layers of issues to decide where would be a good investment right so First, you're looking at the uncertainty of future. You're looking at what their performance is. Was it, was it a company or industry that was suffering before the pandemic? And did they get better or worse during the pandemic? And weighing those factors and deciding what is the future for that industry, that company. And I, this is what I go through in my mind when I go through the different sectors, just to wrap in what we talked about just a little bit ago, and you try and figure out, okay, which industry is likely to bounce back quicker? And then within that industry, which company is and which has management, right? So these all these layers that it sounds like you need to peel back uh, amid, in, amidst the uncertainty of what's in the future. So valuation is definitely tougher. Um, looking at the assets is, is the safest bet to say, is it a core, or do they have the core assets that are going to maintain value? And um, I think that's how I would kind of summarize that, right? Okay. So what I want to get to is um, what are some of the options for owners of distressed businesses? And then we're going to take it on the flip side and, and go back to the investors. But for, for this one, um, Dan, do you want to just talk briefly how you're creating, you know, how, what, what options Hilco actually brings to the table for current owners in distress. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a lot of ways to look at it if you're a business right now. And you gotta reevaluate a lot of the different aspects of your business. And to the extent that we talk to a ton of folks who have what I'll call excess assets, surplus assets, non-core assets, orphan businesses, where there's a piece of the business that has value and a piece of the business that has assets that doesn't have value. Um, you know, take a retailer, for example, we play heavily in the retail space. You have a ton of retailers right now who are sitting on excess inventory, not just retailers, consumer products companies in general, um, excess inventory. And, you know, look at apparel, you know, you have a huge issue with seasonal inventory. Right? Everybody had fall and summer inventory sitting there and didn't sell it at all. And they're sitting on this inventory that actually they might be getting credit today in their borrowing base, but they're not going to be able to move and they're not going to be able to get credit later on um, as this thing, as that inventory gets more and more aged. Or maybe you have aged inventory that you're not getting credit in your borrowing base for at all. Um, and so evaluating that in the right way and figuring out how to monetize that in different ways. And that's where Hilco has been very successful over the last several months helping different businesses monetize excess assets, inventory, machinery and equipment, maybe a sale lease back on real estate um, in different ways has been a very effective strategy to help boost liquidity, but also get rid of underperforming assets and things that actually might be costing you money to maintain businesses or business lines or business units that are actually burning cash. So not only are you monetizing them, and getting cash from those assets, but you're taking away the burn that those are representing, there actually can be a dual benefit from that. So I think folks need to really look at that. And it, you know, I, I think dovetailing on some of the comments that were made earlier in terms of add-on acquisitions, we've partnered with a lot of strategic buyers um, or financial buyers doing add-on acquisitions in that type of way in exactly that manner, right? They want this piece of the business um, and that's what they're going to bolt on to their, to their existing business. But there's a whole other part of the business that has asset value that they don't want, that is losing money, doesn't have enterprise value, but it has asset value that we can come in and partner in a different way and really create value for the seller and create value for the buyer. All right. Thank you, Dan. Marisol, can you pull up that slide? I, in the, I'm looking at the time and... Um, what we're going to do now, I'm just going to point out this slide. I'm not going to go through it because this is obviously, you know, each of those are an hour and in them of themselves. The point of this slide to, is to give you some overview of options. We were going to go through this, but we're not going to have the time. Um, some of these are state court uh, matters and they vary from state to state. 
Um, so you really need to uh, understand each of these to understand your options. Chapter 11 being the one that you really need to understand and need to understand the options. And I say that because when you approach uh, people that are in the industry, lenders in particular, uh, investors, they, they know creditors, they know what a chapter 11 will produce for them. And so they're gonna evaluate all the other uh, options based off what they think their return would be or their opportunities would be in a chapter 11. Um, these are some of the things that Dan touched on as well. I mean, you can, I'm gonna just go through this, looking at this wind down, you know, it's pretty clear. Google some of these words, you'll get an understanding assignment for the benefit of creditors, like a wind down, but you give it to a third party to do it for you. UCC Article 9, think about that as um, a, a lender selling its a selling assets um, for its, its personal property. So it's a way for a lender to sell their personal property collateral. Out of court workouts, this is going to be consensual, whatever a debtor or borrower or seller agrees with somebody. If you're trying to invest, all right, you're going to be looking at the uh, loan to own type of transactions, possibly. Are you going to purchase the debt? Where in the capital stack are you going to purchase the debt? Uh, the debt. You want to have the fulcrum. You want to know where it breaks as far as recoveries. So these are all things you need to consider. There's a lot that goes into these options as far as what is the goal? Is it to sell the business, to buy the business, to downsize? How much is it gonna cost? How much time do you have? How much money do you have? What's the party's risk tolerance? The nature and level of distress? What is the cash position? Are there any assets that are unencumbered? What's the type and size of the company, right? And what are the tax implications? Is it a pass-through entity that will not shield the the debtor from debt income anyway, or is it a C-Corp? Um, what's the type of debt involved? Is it secure, trade, mass tort? The relationship with the creditors? Is it public, private, of personal guarantees? What if I do share duties? That's just some factors to start going into which one of these things you might wanna do. So I just look at that. We don't have time to go through all of that. Um, I, I do wanna jump ahead to one thing, and so I'm gonna jump to Mark, I think it was. For due diligence, when we have these tight time frames, what are some of the things that we can do to, for an investor to do some, some due diligence because they're not gonna have the time to do the thorough due diligence that you would have in a healthy company? Yeah, sure. Uh, look, the, the most important thing is, is understanding near-term liquidity. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're an investor, you're trying to buy a company, you want to understand the near term liquidity. You also want to understand the, how much money I'm going to need to put in, uh, because that's going to affect my valuation. So that, 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 that's the, the key consideration. Um, uh, uh, near term liquidity, uh, you can understand by a 13 week cash flow. Um, many companies, uh, uh, aren't, uh, familiar with this you know, tool, which is a tool in, in toolbox that we use to, uh, to communicate that to lenders and, and buyers. Um, but, but that gives you, you know, cash in, cash out, what's needed, are there gaps, where are the gaps, how much they are, and how do we try and figure out how to fill them? Um, another thing that goes into that is uh, uh, the working capital, understanding receivables, um, inventory, um, and the cycles so that uh, you can better manage uh, the cash flow in the business. Understanding the payable situation, um, how far past due the, uh, the, the vendors and counterparties are, um, that's a critical piece of information. Um, so the, these are kind of st standard tools. And then of course, um, you know, if you can get a business plan, that's a one-year business plan, if the company's prepared one, or you can have, um, uh, you know, your advisor prepare one if you're a buyer, um, you know, take a look at the business, um, your investment banker assists you or someone like us, a financial advisor, um, you, you want to understand what the liquidity needs are for the business are for the next year and what the business is, is capable of. Um, and, and as was said before, at least in this cycle, you need multiple variations of that business plan um, you know, to understand what potential outcomes are. But those are some of the key items of due diligence. And oftentimes in a company that's distressed, it's very difficult to get that information because 
uh, management teams overwhelmed, things are fast moving. Uh, but, um, you know, again, advisors really help with that. Uh, you know, chief restructuring officer put into a company helps focus on the restructuring and the sale effort with the investment banker so that the company can kind of focus on operating itself and making sure that it doesn't drown in the sea. Um, you know, so that, that helps. A lot of times the information that we're talking about, um, it could be as simple as an AR aging, you know, uh, you can look at an AR aging. It doesn't make any sense. The company never ran it properly. And that's one of the reasons why it's in the trouble it's in. So sometimes you don't have the due diligence information. It needs to be created. And that's where uh, advisors can help uh, create that stuff. Yeah, no, no, no question about it. Um, I would just say, don't anyone just delve into a distressed transaction without the appropriate advisors in hand. One last question, because we're running out of time here. I see this last slide. But in the COVID situation, can you, those of you who involved, how are you handling virtual due diligence? How are you doing your site checks, uh, Dan, for your, you know, your real estate? when people aren't around, or you do, are there things virtually, if people aren't around, how are you handling due diligence in the COVID situation? Is there something different you're doing? Yeah, look, when we can do it virtually, we do. Um, but we've actually, you know, look, between mid-March and late May, we were not able to do diligence on a lot of deals. And uh, some of our businesses, as a result, from an investment standpoint, were at a standstill. Today, we actually are, when we can, in a safe way, sending folks to look at real estate, to look at factories, machinery equipment, to look at retail businesses. Um, so we are doing on-site diligence today. Um, in a safe way, we'll go into plants that are shut down where we can distance from people. Um, we won't go into operating facilities where you know it's crowded, um, but we need to do on-site diligence. A lot of our businesses don't work virtually. so. Uh, if we can do it, we will. If we can do it safely, we will. And, and we are today. Okay. And yeah, I'm, in, I'm sorry. If you want to take maybe one or two questions from the audience, we can go a, a couple minutes over. There are a few in the queue. Uh, yeah. If you have to understand, but, but why don't you go ahead? Okay, great. So what I'd like to, uh, one of the questions that we were going to have is, um, where, are, where do people find the distress deals? How, how are they finding them? That's a, that's a great question. And, um, I, I, you know, I think there's some frustration out there. Uh, right now, uh, people are expecting a tidal wave of distressed companies coming to market, and there's a trickle. And, uh, you know, you're told they're coming, and they are coming. And the reason why they're, they're not out there is because um, as we, we said before, there's a global forbearance. Everybody's giving everybody else a break. There's PPP money. Um, and the second quarter numbers haven't come out yet. And for those reasons, companies aren't facing pressure to, to do something, um, to finance, to refinance, to get incremental liquidity, um, to uh, uh, get uh, incremental equity coming into the business or, or sale. And, and you know that should be coming in, in the fall, after the, the, the numbers come out, um, assuming that there isn't a massive injection of government money to kind of extend the runway. Um, so, uh, you know, investment bankers um, are utilized heavily in this environment because, um, you know, you, you, as a company, companies can't go to market by themselves. Um, it's, it's, it's too time consuming, it's too difficult uh, how you explain your value, you need a professional for that. So people who are looking for distressed deals really have to um, be in touch with the investment bankers now um, to, to, to get wind of these. Uh, same thing with, with people like us, the turnaround advisors that are working with distressed companies right now. And many of us are working with companies that were already distressed pre-COVID. Um, so they have pre-existing conditions and may not be as interesting. Um, but, but, you know, we do see things before they come to market. Um, so the advisors are the, pl are the place to go um, to keep in touch on a regular basis to make sure that you're aware of, of the opportunities, both on the, on the equity and on the, on the debt side. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. You gotta be, I mean, deals come from all over the place, right? It's not just lawyers, it's bankers, it's lenders, it's, it's across the board. It's the turnaround advisors, 
but there's no question that the lenders are going to drive when this goes from a trickle, which I'm not sure it's a trickle today, but to the tidal wave. And you're only four months into this. They remember that, you know, there's only been four missed payments. So as, as people become more delinquent, as these things drag on longer, as the government subsidies start to expire, um, that's when the lenders are going to start clamping down on the borrowers. And that's when the flow is going to increase. I suspect the fourth quarter and into the first quarter is going to be really when this picks up dramatically. I'm just going to add to that um, for those that want to seek debt uh, at, at some point if you're dealing with a public a current public lender or BDC that may file something if you really want to put the effort in to looking at public filings and seeing what debt they've already written down um, what they mark down sometimes there's an opportunity there to then say okay they've marked it down I can now buy it at a discount and then assert it at par so there, there is some legwork you can do when you're dealing with public investors and lenders. But as everyone has said, the reason you're hearing that it's coming and, it's, and you can't find it is it's not quite here yet. So I'd also, I would just add to that too, that different industries have different catalysts. I mean, just like any normal M&A process, really for, the, for a, a deal to come to market or for a seller or a lender or a, a cap stack to, Thing, it's going to have a catalyst. And so, you know, in energy, for example, there, which is probably not the interest of most of the audience here, but there are semi-annual redetermination dates. And so those semi-annual bank redetermination dates um, then drive a, drive a catalyst. And in consumer, um, obviously, it's seasonally cyc cyclical around the holidays. So I think that what you're going to see is that different industries will have different opportunities based on underlying fundamentals of that industry and then how that's driving um, particularly lenders to sort of say, you know, at some point, you know, we can amend, we can extend, we can work with you, but at some point we need either you to put an, an injection of new equity into this business or for a buyer to come or for something to happen so that we right size the capital structure. And, you know, the, uh, the thing that wasn't said I don't believe on today's call, but the, you know, one of, there, there's several different distress and restructuring investment strategies, but a classic one is to look for good company or good asset with a bad capital structure. And I would, I would suspect that's probably where most of this audience will find the, the types of opportunities that they're looking for. And so when those catalysts occur, it'll usually be driven by a board and or a lender saying this is, um, you know, we, we can't continue on this because there's potential degradation, degradation at some point by continuing on with supplier relationships, can, reputation with consumer, et cetera, around a brand or a product or a quality of service, et cetera. Um, and so I think um, those catalysts will be coming, but I think you'll see it in different industries at different times in the, in the coming months. Well, that, that's very true what Jason just said. Um, just as an example, consumer products, you know, a lot of consumer products companies, you know, shipping for, you know, Christmas is, as you said, Jason, and, um, you know, you go into a working capital cycle where you have a need, right? You have a need in the fall or the late summer. And, uh, you know, there, there are consumer products companies that are, you know, need liquidity now that, you know, if you're a lender um, and you're interested in consumer products, this is the time to, to knock on doors because there are a lot of consumer products companies that need incremental liquidity going into the, the you know, the next season. Um, so I think it's very true what Jason said. Okay, I give see, me a I call. See, uh, I see, that's what I was about to say. I see Lena there. I just want to say one last thing. I know there was a lot more we wanted to touch on. Um, I have always been thinking since during the, uh, during the pandemic and I'm sitting at home, this is my office actually, but of doing more informal uh, discussions like this and, and doing a deeper dive onto some of these topics. If you're interested, um, definitely connect with me on LinkedIn and reference this webinar, connect with Opus and make sure you're following their events. And obviously these panelists know what they're doing. So if you have questions, I encourage you to pick up the phone, send an email, link in with them, and uh, we're, we're here to help you. So happy to assist. Uh, thank you, Carolyn, and thank you to all of our panelists. I think that was a great discussion. Thank you to our audience for joining us as well. Um, we do have our next webinar coming up on August 11th. If you all are participating in our Distress Deal Connect one-on-one -on -one meetings, you're going to log out of here now and log into the separate link that my colleague Terrence Winters circulated to all of you. 
So please um, log out of here and go into there. If you have questions you know, or need help, reach out. But again, thank you to our panelists and Carolyn for leading the way, to our sponsors, uh, and to all of you. We look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you, Lena. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.